got to move this industry forward. We have to break down the silos between developers and designers and contractors. Like we are literally designing and building and shaping communities and the planet. It's like musical chairs. I know. <laughs> Somebody's getting the back. <laughs> um, so, hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca Snelling, and I uh, want to ask our, our panelists here to just give a brief introduction of themselves and their role within their company. Uh, you already heard my name. I work for Hexagon, uh, least known company in the Leeds Luxury New Space. One of the CEOs for one of our companies back there. Um, I've been around at Hexagon for 25 years, most of my career, done mostly innovation for the last 15, and now I lead the Open Innovation Platform. Great, thank you. So thank my, you. my name is Angel Dizon. Uh, I work for the General Services Administration, which is a horrible name for an organization, <laughs> uh, but I'm the Regional Commissioner uh, for the Great Lakes region for all the public buildings there. And, and before that, I was the Managing Director over at the State Department, uh, responsible for all the planning and design for the embassies and consulates. And so I've spent half my career as a consultant to the federal government, and then the other half is a public servant. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah Shank, we thought about calling on the audience to ask if you guys remember what I said earlier. I did, but uh, we won't do that. Um, I, today I'm going to focus on the innovation pillar. I, I talked this morning about the three different pillars I have. One of them is innovation, and uh, I'm going to focus on that this afternoon. Great. And, uh, and one of the things that you might have missed, too, with Sarah this morning, part of her role around innovation is she's responsible for the culture that goes along with implementation of systems and processes. So we've got three very different perspectives here with us today, and we want, we want to start with just asking each of you to share a little bit from your perspective within your silo and your organization what does innovation actually mean and look like? Sarah, you want to start us off? So innovation within PGM real estate is really focused a lot around prop tech. So less around construction tech, even though I know that this is a focus of this, <laughs> this group here, but mostly on existing building prop tech. Um, and uh, the way that I've set up the innovation group at PGM Real Estate is I have three directors or two directors of innovation and an associate and um, we are global and we have 14 different innovation councils um, across all of PGM Real Estate that are um, spearheaded by the business and this will be my theme of the day in terms of building culture. Um, everything we really do is really driven by the business. Um, so. These 14 innovation councils are things like um, the U.S. Office Asset Man Management Innovation Council, and that is uh, chaired by our head of U.S. Office Asset Management. And now, one of my directors of innovation sits on that council, um, but it, they, we don't chair it. It is chaired by the asset management um, head. And, uh, she has other people on her team on that, um, and they are the ones that determine what are the problem statements, focal points that they want us to look into. So that's great. That's a little bit of an <laughs> overview. <laughs> so that's your perspective that she's coming from. That's awesome, Angel. Yeah, and we're actually kind of in the same business-ish, right? Um, and for me, innovation's about impact, right? That there is something that we're trying to achieve, and innovation helps us get there. And for me, my focus is about, and because I, I've spent my whole entire career focused on public buildings, it's about maximizing the outcomes around uh, economics, about, around environment, around social. And I'm spending your money, just so you know. Uh, I'm spending taxpayer money, and what we should be getting is we should be getting a building that performs and functions the way that we expect, and it should be able to provide these other kinds of outcomes. They should be able to be both there. And you know, it's essential in the way that I think about it. And for me, it's like water. Um, if you look, think about great civilizations in the world, they always started around big bodies of water, which I think about in terms of big bodies of innovation, and they've changed the world. And it doesn't have to always be that way, but it's a part of how you get there. And so if we think about all the things that we've gotten to today, it's because we've made these small incremental changes. 
And so I think what scares people off when you talk about innovation is what that scale is. And some of it is the things that you guys are doing, and some of it's our little bitty things to just make it a little bit faster, a little bit leaner, a little bit cheaper, those kinds of things. But they're all valuable. Great. And Milan? My turn. Uh, <laughs> I work for Hexagon that most people in this room have never heard of. Um, I actually work at the Manufacturing Intelligence Division, which is where I've been for 20 years. Um, we do have a division that does construction and BIM and a bunch of stuff, which is Rahul is kind of uh, representing. Um, but innovation in our space is slightly different in a, in a sense that we're a public company, we've been very successful, so every quarter we deliver results. So to do any kind of great leaps in innovation is very hard. Um, so we do awesome incremental stuff, and we keep yeah. printing money, and that, that's okay. Um, I've worked myself trying to do disruptive innovation from inside that that usually doesn't get anywhere because the sales organization is not necessarily tooled up to do new things, which is also another conflict. And I think sometimes innovation, depending where you are, and I think it's also very much between U.S. between Europe, depends what that is invented, what is it thought of. In Europe, a little bit, it's a little bit more kind of I have a PhD and I invent things and do things, things like that. In the US, it's a little bit more process systems and other things that the innovation tends to happen. Both tend to have its place. But Sixth Sense was formed primarily because we kind of realized great inspiration comes from startups, some of which are in this room. But there was no forum for us to work with them. We bought them lunches or bought them dinners and we spent five years and they became a billion dollar companies. We're like, oh man, we should have really done something with them. <laughs> Now we're finally in a space where we can grab them early on, have that influence, and the kind of what everybody touched on is we're very public in what we do. We publish it everywhere, we're on social media, we do stuff, and the idea is to engage not only, Hexa, not only Hexagon employees, but people to learn more about Hexagon to go present kind of the idea that we're more open, more transparent, more interested in to bring that innovation in and to try to help foster and scale it. Great. So three of you with slightly different definitions of how you view innovation within your organization, how it plays out. Um, and this one, I'd rather than go around, have this one be a little bit more conversational. How do you see innovation and culture connected to each other or problematic with each other? They're interlinked, right? I, I was talking to you yesterday. I introduced myself and we were talking about it. He goes, I said, I'm with the government. And he goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, shit, that's a, what a tough way to start the day. Um, but as much, you know, if I think about what my old job was, 120 million square feet overseas. This job has got 380 million square feet. DOD's got 2.2 billion square feet. You can make gigantic mistakes. And I've talked to some of you that are actually telling me about the mistakes that we've made. But you make terrible mistakes if you're not thinking about that. And so it, it's... They're, they're tied together, and the government's not known for it, you know, and I think it was probably, like, if you think about, if you talk to other folks, you go, and you talk about good enough for government today, it kind of means shit, right? It says, oh, it's good enough for government. It's not a really, it's not a compliment. But in the 40s, good enough for government meant it was of the highest caliber. It was tested and vetted, and it was good enough for government, then it was good enough for you. We can bring that back. But the culture has to change. And so I just started my job at GSA, so I don't know anything about it in the way that I probably should. Uh, but when I met with everybody in the region, you know, they, one of the questions was, hey, what would you ask all of, of us? And I said, just ask why. Why about anything that we have? You know, why do we do this? Why do we do that? Because that curiosity will help. Uh, but we all have to be in a position to allow that curiosity to happen, to let some failure happen so that we can be, so we can be innovative. But it's, it's really tied together, and sometimes that stuff doesn't exist in the organization. As much as you try, it doesn't exist. We were talking about you know, those kicking off big movements and getting everybody together and all the hooping and hollering in the t-shirt and then also the next day they're doing the same thing they were before. Because it's in them, right? It's in, it's in the DNA. Somebody had mentioned it today. It has to be inside you to be curious and to be wanting to improve things. And it's, it's tough. But it has, I think we can set examples at the top and then you have to find the right people in the organization and then recruit some others to sort of bring it all together. Yeah, and that ties with my idea <laughs> of it being like business driven. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that I totally agree with the title of this uh, panel, the stale antiquated business. I think she's talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I mean, real estate has been doing things the same way it's been doing it for yeah. quite some time and been very successful. So I, I'm not sure that we can say that it's stale and antiquated. 
but I can say that it's very adverse to change. So yeah. because people make a lot of money doing the things that they've been doing it for a very long time. Just like construction. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's, and that's part of, yeah. when I say real estate, I mean all, all, all aspects of real estate. Um, so uh, in, in general, people are adverse to change as a, as a general rule. So my philosophy is, you know, let the business lead us with what, what are your problems? What are, what are the things that you're facing? We'll help you find a technology to, to help combat that. And then you're more incentivized to want to implement that because you've, already, you've stated it's a problem. Whereas if I come to you and say, I, I want you to implement this, they will very, it, it's, it's PGM, so it's very nice people everywhere. They will nicely <laughs> say sure and then not do it. Um, so uh, we, the, the, the concept of having it be business led in partnership, very much in partnership with the innovation team, which is also, you know, I'm part of the, I oversee the systems team, so it's all, all in partnership, um, has provided some more success. I'm not going to say change. This is easy now. It's it's because it's not, <laughs> but you know it does it does help to to provide you know a more motivation for the the people to try innovative solutions. Um, I, you know, I'll just follow with a similar theme, which is I think culture and change in culture has to be intentional. I, I don't think things tend to happen like as we were just saying. Yeah. Give some T-shirts out and PowerPoints, and suddenly people <laughs> change culture organically. Um, we use within six cents, we use a little bit of manufacturing, by the way, is no different. It's perceived as stale. Of course, it's a very dynamic thing and it makes a lot of money. So people tend to just do things over and over. Um, angles where I think there's, I like, like I appreciate this room. It's, there's a little bit of diversity here, um, which, is, which is great. You know, so KP thing, that's a good thing. In manufacturing in general, there is none. Uh, there's a great variety of white men, you know, tall, short, tall, <laughs> tall, tall, tall white men. And, uh, and uh, we try to use the startups because there's a good way for ESG. What we've learned is that a lot of ESG kind of initiatives are better if you actually bring startups in to bring that change. Because if you go in and tell people to do something differently, it's really hard. Because it's really hard to change your habits that you had for 20 years or 15 years or whatever it is. And it's, it's to suddenly wake up in the morning and suddenly, oh, I'm now a different person. It doesn't work like that. It's also higher, for example, from diversity and inclusion angle to suddenly have diverse and inclusive culture because if people walk in a room and they're getting interviewed, there's six white people and there's a person of color sitting there, how are they supposed to then take a job? So, but you have to be intentional, which is you have to really make an effort to change that culture. And I think the other part is transparency and honesty has to be respected. Rather than being a stick so that you, when you say something honestly, you're afraid of being punished, I think people should encourage that. And people yeah. make mistakes, and people are people. And I think just respecting humans for humans is what tends to foster yeah. change. And that's not, I mean, I'm not saying that we had what we're doing now, that we like snapped our fingers and saying that's change. It's very, very difficult, but you have to be intentional in wanting to do that. Yeah, I was going to add, in terms of changing the people part of it, yeah. is a lot of what I have to do is change their perspective on what they think they do. Yeah. And so I'll ask people, what do you do? And I just tell them they're wrong. <laughs> I said, your job, that's not your job. Your job is to maximize social impacts or whatever the hell you want to say. I said, that's your job. This other stuff is a sort of mechanism to get us there. Uh, but I have to pivot their perspective on what their responsibilities are. It's that, that JFK quote about the NASA janitor. You know, what do you do here? And I send people to the moon. It's that same kind of a thing. Is everybody's going to be pitching in the same direction. Now, the whole organization won't do it. But if you have enough of them leaning in one direction, you can probably do great things. Yeah. Now, both of you touched on allowing people to fail or have mistakes, right? So how do you, if you're in an organization that doesn't do that, how do you start to shift <laughs> that thinking? <laughs> you well, might have I mean, some recent experience, I mean, right? I, mean I, I can share. I mean, I, when I was doing my own you know, development of stuff, you know, half of my projects were awesome and half of them are garbage. Um, and it's okay to be proud of you know, your, your, your bad babies as your good babies. And as long as you, you are allowed to, that that's the way it, that life works, that not anything, everything has to be perfect all the time, I think you build a culture. I'm not, I'm not a big believer like, you know, you break things and move fast. I don't think that's a good, I think it's break things and learn fast. Maybe it's yeah, a better yeah. way to say things. But I think if you don't use failures to learn things about yourself or about culture or about the organization is what 
companies tend to do a lot. Mm -hmm. If you're able to foster those errors to actually improve what you do, is I think you actually have a better innovative yeah. culture in the long run. No, you're right. I mean, the big thing is it's, it's a people game and people make mistakes all the time, so it's just a part of the business, you have to accept it. Like you, I'm like, I don't mind making mistakes, I just don't make the same one twice. And so yeah, you just have to learn from them, that's the key. So how do you make that tangible? Learning from mistakes is easy to hear and easy to say, sure, we do it. How do you actually uh, do The government has a ton of processes for <laughs> after action reports and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, you just have to document what the experience was and what those findings are and just make sure that we're considering those kinds of things when we make those kinds of changes. The reality is the government's not great at being innovative on its own. It, it has to work in partnership with everybody else. The government's really good at buying stuff. So that's what I try to encourage, let's, let's just go buy that. Let's go buy that and make the relationship, find out what we need and then just go buy that. But there's no reason to try to have that stuff in house. Uh, and so I, I'm a believer in a smaller government, uh, but just need to leverage the right kinds of things. So the government's got a responsibility, there's things that only the government can do, but the rest of it you can, you can work with others to figure out. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to describe an ideal innovative culture, besides <laughs> accepting failure and learning from it, what else would you add to that list? I mean, I think some of the stuff that, that you guys have talked about in terms yeah. of uh, being open-minded, like asking questions, willing to, to try things. Um, there was an earlier conversation around um, piloting. Um, piloting, it really has to be a two-way street, which means that um, PGM really has to uh, provide support from our side as well. We actually put it into most of our contracts that you know we will dedicate X number of resources on the pilot, and I recommend you guys put that in, like force your, to the extent you can force, but you know, <laughs> put something that, you know, especially on a free pilot, that the, uh, <laughs> that the, you know, the landlord will provide support, and, and we do, like we work really hard on a pilot, um, and, I think that's really that's a very important part of an innovation innovative culture. Um, it, it it has to come from the top. We have you know I report to the global COO. Um, she is very supportive of this, as is our global CEO. Um, I often have to speak at our town halls, <laughs> again and again and again, about all the things that we're doing. I send out a monthly newsletter. Um, it's very much. A part of the conversation of um, what PGM real estate is currently and what it is going forward. Um, so I, I think all of that is is really important. Um, being open to change, but you know it's also changing real estate, you know, changing industries that are have been doing things for the same way for a really long time is very difficult. So um, I, I look for two things when I hire people. Uh, whether they work in the organization or outside. Uh, and the first one is passion, right? You have to really give a shit about what I do. Uh, you have to care about trying to solve, you know, my issues and my mission, those kinds of things. Uh, and you have to care with everything you've got, uh, the same way that I do. And then the second thing is persistence. Uh, it's hard, like you described, right? The industry makes it hard, government makes it even harder. Uh, so you have to fight through a whole lot of stuff. But if you have those two qualities, for me, um, we're probably going to be successful in, in innovating in the way that we will, that, that we're trying to, because you're, you're going to have that desire, and then you're going to have that heart to sort of keep going. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's not easy, for sure, but it, it takes, sometimes it takes legislation, right? It takes somebody to start pushing down. Owners can be in a position to ask for it. I think I've heard of, of, from a lot of y'all that the client didn't want this or client didn't want that, and when I came to, to government, I was a consultant, and this guy that I ended up working for said, hey, would you like to work for the government? And I was like, well, that's a horrible idea. What a, what a terrible idea. Because I said, you guys suck at this. You're not good at that. And they're like, he goes, can you help us get better? And I was like, I can maybe figure out how you work, and then I'll try to sell you services on the back end. That's what my idea was. And uh, I worked for them for like three or four years, and I took this leadership training thing and opened my eyes to other people in government that are trying to do good things in a really kind of hard environment. And I said, this is worthy of my time and effort to try to make the government better, to be a more educated client so I can work with y'all in a way that I can ask for the kinds of things that you guys want to do and then we can sort of work together and do that. Um, and so that's what I've been sort of focused on trying to do is just be a better client 
to all of you, be a better customer so that I can get the awesome stuff that you guys are doing and then just try to deploy it in the kinds of things that I think would be beneficial to all of us. I can just, persistence was something that resonated. Um, all of us, I'm sure all three of us have had the same conversation with the same people like 40 times. Yeah. And 41st time, suddenly something, you know, something goes off and, and something happens. I've also been lucky that Hexagon, I've, every job I've had at Hexagon did not exist before I had it, meaning I kind of went to somebody and said, I think I should do this, and they're like, okay. And, uh, and that's part of that persistence, which is many times you get turned down and you kind of keep going at it if you have passion and you believe that that's where it needs to go. Yeah. And I think in a sense, sometimes you infect people around you and they tend to then try to do similar things. And that's, I think, kind of a little bit how culture tends to spread over time. Right. So. Yeah. It can be equally contagious, yeah, right? Exactly. The people saying no and the people saying yes. Yeah. Yep. So what are some of the barriers then to driving <laughs> that innovative culture in your organization? I mean, we started this with the same thing. All, I mean, yeah. government, <laughs> we, success, we can say government's successful, <laughs> but we work for private entities that, or public entities that essentially, at the end of the day, um, are successful. Com I mean, Hexagon prints cash every year and it's very successful and it's grown leaps and bounds. We've, we started with acquisition in 2000, now we acquire 177 companies, something like that, 180, and it's grown. So you can sit there and say, well, there's an urgency because there's a startup here that's gonna do something and disrupt us and everything else, and everybody goes, but why? We just had the record year. We literally just had the record year, year before that. So what's the urgency? And we all know that technology cliffs, they don't go like this and go smoothly. They just kind of just fall off one day. So you just always have to have urgency, persistence, and I think that's what's necessary. And I think the biggest barrier is that incremental innovation in general is good enough to foster the numbers and to push them up. That's mm -hmm. it. I mean, that's the biggest enemy of the whole so thing. So success. So success is, is, is the enemy. worst thing. So, <laughs> I mean, it's probably for you. I totally agree. I mean, I, uh, I always remember this conversation I had with a very senior leasing person um, in New York at a different company um, about a technology called VTS, which you may or may not know. Um, and I was telling him all of the reasons why he should use this technology and it would uh, help him be much more efficient in his leasing process and, and uh, he could look at his phone at any point and see where the status of his leases, all of this stuff. And it, it was like a 20 minute thing, that a conversation that I had, I was a reference for, for the company VTS. And um, at the end he said, why can't I just keep using Excel. <laughs> and I said, you can. Like, you're, you're making, he, he was probably making millions of dollars personally using Excel. And like, you, you can. I just gave you all the reasons why it would be better to use this other new technology, but you're right, you can keep using it. And that, that's, what, that's what I face every day with you know, not exactly Excel, but some version <laughs> of that. With That's a tough day, but it was Excel. <laughs> yeah, right. Excel is a, is a favorite tool, <laughs> oh, yeah. most certainly. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that is a big, a big challenge. They, yeah. And it, it goes back to people have been very successful in real estate yeah. for a very long time doing it the way they've been doing it. So why do they change? Well, that's my, the biggest barrier for me is people, right? And they, why do I have to change? It's yeah. uncomfortable. I don't like it. And it's, you fight it from the bottom and you fight it from the top. Yeah. Like I was, I was coming out to this thing and my boss was like, why are you going there? And I'm like, this is the same question. I'm like, why are you going to innovation summit? I'm like, because it's important for government to interact with everybody and, and try to figure out what's coming. And so I met some folks and there's some things that, are, that we're gonna talk about you know, with me and them. And I'm like, it's great. I said, but we all have to be, it's all of our jobs to be doing it. I just can't sit there and talk to myself about how awesome we are. I gotta go figure it out with others. And then from the bottom, it's a lot of, it's not my job, that's someone else's job. Mm. And you know, like the Excel guy, I think he works at my organization too. <laughs> and it's like, why do I have to change? It works just fine the way that it does. So I, I took over this, uh, so I was at the State Department and I started running this one division that was all the architects and engineers, so it was about 200 of them. And I get in there and said, hey, what can I do to help you? What is the things that you need to be much more productive? And this is literally seven years ago, they said, oh yeah. I'm glad that you asked that. We could use a whole bunch of magnifying glasses. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, the drawings are really small, so this would really help. I'm like, holy shit, this is how bad I, I, I picked up this whole thing. And I said, we, I, I said, I understand your problem. It's hard to read. I said, we'll do better than that, and we'll figure it out. So over the next few years, I was like, we just 
now we're now doing, or they're now doing it all digitally, and we're using you know all the right kinds of software. But it it took a lot, and they just had to know, and they didn't want to use new software because it was I like the old thing or whatever it is. I said, well, what if I told you it would be faster? What if I told you that you would have more time to do the things that you really want to do, and this would, the stuff that's sometimes tedious would be a lot less? Okay, maybe. But it, we're all motivated by different kinds of things, and sometimes the government employees motivated by doing less work. And this is the one way I was able to get them. It's like you could do less but achieve more if we did it this way. But it's it's a people thing, you know, all over. People that don't want to give you money, people that don't want to give you a chance. Uh, and so I think the the barrier is overcomable. Uh, it just requires education and engagement, and and talk about the possibility and the purpose and all that stuff. And you'll break through somewhere, like on the forty first oh, chance. That's first. But I, I want to say there's one more thing which is the thing the companies that become more successful talk to customers less and less. Because you start believing your own hype and yeah. you think you no longer need to talk to people to figure out what makes you successful because you already are successful. Yeah. And I think I've seen a lot of mature organizations essentially twist from pretending they're doing design thinking because they're using post-it notes. And then when you actually ask somebody, <laughs> did they go and talk to a customer to validate any of the ideas, they go, no. And I'll give you just a short story about this. We did our user reach side, we make machines that inspect things for quality and everything else. And we went into field and talked to a bunch of people and everything else, and we came back and we had a whole management of the company there, and we're like, so what do you think? And of course they thought, faster machines, more accurate machines, da 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 And it was a simple answer. Everybody hated it because the machines don't have a light, because they can't see the surface of the machine. And it's a very simple, and that's innovation too. We shouldn't dismiss that. But the, the idea is that I think the more successful you get, the more you think like over here, yeah. and the problems are over there. And I think that disconnect sometimes is what causes problems when you try to innovate. So. Yeah. Owners are in the same place too. Yeah. You know, you, we think we know all the stuff that we need to know about our business, but you just, we just don't. You know, but, but collectively, we're, we're, you know, we're very smart. Then it, it ties back to something that you said earlier about going to where people have problems. But also something I heard on an earlier panel is sometimes we don't always know what our problems are, but other people can help illuminate mm -hmm. them for mm -hmm. us, right? So how do you help people understand that they do have opportunity for improvement when they don't necessarily see it? I don't know, magic for me, for me at least, <laughs> is the magic is like getting people to be okay with saying, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think it's a really, I don't know how people in this room are, but. If you sit in a room and you just don't know something, don't pretend you do. Just say, I don't know what you're talking about. Or somebody says a word and I ask, tell me what that means. Yeah. Because otherwise, you create a false sense of security between people who don't really know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> and to me, I think it is an obstacle because I'm sure you, everybody here works with people who've been working for 20, 30 years. And to say that you don't know something is not perceived well. Mm -hmm. So, but if, if there's a culture that accepts that, it's a good starting starting point, and I think that some people then liberate it to follow that on with other conversations. Yeah, when you can be vulnerable with each other, right, and well, honest. Yeah, that's exactly it. I don't know a whole lot of stuff. I barely graduated college, so <laughs> um, you know, at school, if I copied somebody, it would be called cheating. But in industry, it's called precedent, right? So it's okay <laughs> if you cheat, you know. And but yeah, you're right. Just being able, to, I, I just don't know, and. You know, I had this, uh, I was meeting with this professor at Northwestern, and she asked me this really great question about what is an embassy in 2050 going to look like? I said, I have no idea. But it started me on this journey to start asking questions about what's happening in the built environment and all this other stuff. And it was great. It opened up a whole lot of doors, and now the State Department is really pushing this embassy 2050 thing, you know, understanding what are those big global drivers, how's it going to change the buildings, how's it going to change the work. You know, we, we, you were talking earlier about, you know, the way that, you know, workplace is changing so much. It changes all the time. And you know, I think in government sometimes we're trying to find that finish line. You know, you talk about a, like a workplace 20 or 30 or something, it's never gonna be there. But what you do know is it's always gonna change. So if you know it's always gonna change, then you just have to be uncomfortable, you know, be comfortable with being uncomfortable, be able to be adaptive, and because it's just constantly gonna be changing. And the way that we use buildings is different now. You don't need it for work. I haven't seen anybody come to the office for work, but I have seen them come together to, you know, to collaborate and to connect. I think what you talked about earlier said, so, you know, need to provide more of that conferencing space. Yeah, that's a good reason to have a building. But some of this other stuff to do your job or whatever it is, less of a need for that. You know. Great. Yeah, I, I've built up a, a network of other people that do innovation, other people, other VCs to like this to, to talk to. 
um, and then prop tech companies that I, I'm constantly talking to to say, what's out there? What, yeah. what should I be looking at? What should I be doing? Um, and yes, there are many times when I'm like, I don't understand the words you're saying at all, because my background is real estate. That was most of my time here, by the way. I was like, <laughs> Seriously. the whole time just Googling, what is that? Seriously, you guys are using a lot of uh, some, uh, abbreviations that I don't understand. Yeah, but, uh, I'm glad there's I'm another trying, one. Of them. Um, but uh, yeah, like that, that's how I find things and like make sure that I'm not missing anything. And you could say, well, you're only talking to other real estate. And some, you know, there are, times where I talk outside of the real estate space and, and definitely learn from you know how people are breaking things in other ways because real estate does tend to look at it in a very specific way um, but but I probably don't do that enough so I should probably do that more but I think you, you just meant struck, struck on something else which is I think which is important which is curiosity I think if you want to change the culture, you have to surround yourself with curious people. Mm -hmm. Because if you're curious, then you'll go and ask people what stuff that you don't know. Yeah. If you're not curious, you'll just kind of accept it and just go along with, with the thing. So I think that's another integral point as you try to shift things around. The right people are the ones who are persistent and curious yep. and want to do things sure. and are okay as we started earlier making mistakes. I mean, that's okay. And that's, but that takes years to build in a, at least organization of our size. So how do you start to build that intentionally? Going back to your word from earlier about being intentional, right? It's not just having some teaming session and handing out t-shirts and going back to what you're doing. How do you really set the tone? What's the role of a leader in making that kind of a shift? I mean, we use Sixth Sense as a way to A, uh, bring up awareness of our brand. As people, as I said, nobody knows. You mentioned Schneider Electric, you mentioned Autodesk, it's a competitor of ours. I'm sure Rahul would like to talk to you about our own product. <laughs> but um, once you, if you don't know and you're not aware, we have to create a different public persona to talk about things. And not just about hexagon, but about subjects we just touched on. Diversity, inclusion, sustainability, and all the other stuff that, that goes on. And you have to be present. And I make mistakes, by the way. I've done interviews where I said stuff that was like, oh my god, why did I just say that? Um, but you have to be okay with that. And I think you have to be willing to engage with not just our industry, I'm here, everybody here is construction, I'm manufacturing, but I appreciate KP inviting us for this. Um, at the end of the day, I've learned a lot that reflects also on what we do at the same time. So it's not like none of this stuff is wasted or anything else. But I think you go back to being intentional, you have to be present to essentially go places and be willing to talk about hard subjects. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that slowly gets everybody else to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, in, in terms of like anchoring in the chain, it's, it, like I said, it's about the people. Like you have to find the right kinds of people. And they exist in everybody's organization. They just have to be allowed some of that opportunity. Um, and then you have to recruit for some of them. And I, I, I look for the same things that you just mentioned, you know, mm -hmm. smart, curious people. And like they probably have a shot at being really successful in the organization because they're just going to keep pushing me a little bit more. And then the, for me, the second part was just partnerships. Um, and the government needs to be working uh, with industry. It also needs to be working with academics. And in those kinds of conversations, we'll find a way to outperform our expectations. Uh, but it'll always be with that, the, the people and the partnerships. Yeah. We're trying to make it easy. Our, our goal is to make it as easy as possible to innovate. So these councils, we have a toolkit, we have a database. We try to make, we're an affiliate of Prudential, which means that there are not as many processes as you have, but there are still a lot of processes to get through. And we try to make it easy to get through all of those processes um, so that we can have lots of pilots and lots of things going on so that people can see that we actually are able to innovate and see what that means and, and yeah. translate that. Um, we are very focused on uh, the KPIs and the, you know, what, what is it that the, the technology is actually doing for us. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> Sweet. It is so you want to say about it. <laughs> this is how innovation does not work all the time. So, there um, so you know, making it easy for people, again, like 
senior leadership has to be uh, supportive of it, but it also needs to come from yeah. from all levels. Like people talk about it needs to come from bottom up. Like I would say it needs to come from middle, bottom, top. Like it needs to come from everywhere. Um, and uh, and it, it needs to focus on problems that they want to solve um, yeah. and, and, uh, and help, help them make, hopefully make their job easier um, in ways that they are currently struggling. Mm -hmm. So, and then, then there's a whole thing around communication. I told you we do a, a monthly newsletter. We have all kinds of, we do videos. Like there's just lots, it, it, there's not a one pronged approach from my opinion. There's lots yeah. of different angles to go with. That's a great, uh, we realized you have to communicate to the organization what you're doing. And if somebody uh, you know, so wants to, to do a brochure or something, which is old school way, it's like you gotta do videos and you have to give them to everybody and 10% will watch, that's okay. And then maybe a year later, 20% will watch. And, but I think kind of go-to-market strategy for your own innovation is an integral part that misses in a lot of places, which is you do innovation and it's over there somewhere and nobody ever sees it. You need to share with people what you're doing, even if it's boring for half of them, it doesn't really matter. But I think to your point is communication and feeding it into the organization is really instrumental to making the it, change. What's funny about the communication part of it, they're only, they're, they're not picking up all the words, right? You might be saying it, but they're not, it's not, it's not digesting, right? But it's, it's what are they experiencing in your actions and your behavior that's probably where they're going to pick up the most. And so that making it easy, right? Giving them the space to be innovative, that's a lot of it. Saying that we want innovation, you can say that a bunch, but it won't mean anything unless it's followed up with a lot of action. That they'll probably experience. You know, they'll understand what it meant, meant for them, what it felt for them, as opposed to the words that we're choosing to talk about. Yeah, and I imagine yeah. that communication does a lot to pull the culture as a whole together too because even if some people are choosing not to participate they're seeing it and feeling it and yeah. eventually you just got to move a portion of it sucked in yeah right? yeah you can't, <laughs> well it just starts leading in a particular way and it's also like why are you here yeah you know and a lot of us are spending all this time in our organization but for what reason at some point it's not the money anymore right there's something else yeah. but once you're able to identify that in people then you can start to pull on that thread a little bit and go, hey, because of that, let's do this or whatever. Is. Then you have a, a shot at getting to that one individual person. And we're all kind of like snowflakes. So each one of us has different kinds of triggers that get them to sort of perform. Uh, and sort of the responsibility of kind of all of us to try to figure out, hey, what is that for you? But it's really hard because some people are motivated by really kind of crazy things. Uh, but if you can find that in them, then you have a chance of getting them kind of really kickstarted in that way. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, not a fan of engagement by seniority. And what I mean by that is just because somebody's CEO doesn't mean that necessarily they can talk in front of a camera. So be very careful who you pick to be oh, the okay, messengers yeah. of the things that you do. That's why they don't want me here. That's well, not let's see, that's, <laughs> that's all kinds of problems. But I mean, I mean, I'm being serious about that is that sometimes you get to a certain senior level. And by the way, I, I agree with Sarah about also the bottom up works to a certain level of a ceiling. The top has to come and support in order to kind of break through the ceiling, I guess. But I think for messaging, you have to engage people who are funny, good public personas, and everything else, because people engage with those kind of people. If somebody just comes on board because there happen to be a particular C-suite position, but they're like, oh my God, I'm gonna go you know, fall asleep while I'm listening <laughs> to this whole thing. That's a bad thing to do, because you just disengage a bunch of people all of a sudden. So you, it, you have to really think about it. We go back to the intent. You have to always be intentional about it. Video should never be more than three minutes long. That's yeah. why I, <laughs> they won't disengage if it's less than three minutes. Ideally, it's two minutes, less than two minutes. I've seen stuff like when people read, so their eyes keep going with this. I was like, you couldn't just spend like 10 minutes just learning. <laughs> yeah. so, it's okay. I'm in. When it goes to something that we were talking about last night, too, we were talking about um, flavors of the month and, and having a program, an innovation program, versus having it embedded in how you operate, um, and just how one person in leadership can unintentionally say the wrong thing that just will shut down um, driving some of that from the ground up. So, yeah. go, go ahead. You, no, I'm not, no, you're okay. going to ask well, <laughs> I'm not. Um, So, what, how do you help make sure you've got continuity and messaging around top level leadership? I don't, I don't know how everybody else does. For, for what I do is we have the, the, the right people. You know, we picked essentially, it's kind of like casting for Hollywood. You cast the people who are going to play certain roles in the organization. 
and you make sure they know what they're going to be saying and you make sure their own message, their own brand and trying to talk about and they also have to be personable. Like you have to people who are engaging and want to bring people to talk to them at the end of the day. So again, you, I go back to the thing we started with, which is the intent. You have to have an intent. I think to what both of you have said, you also have to have a plan and you have to have a way to support all of that. Because if you are just this one person doing things on Fridays, it's not going to get you there. The, 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 the management organization has to support what you're trying to do and then give you as much push uh, as they can. But having a brand, I think, having words associated what, with what you mean by innovation, when, when I say I'm the global head of innovation, the first thing everyone says is, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> no one knows what that means. And so you, you, need, to you, you need to have your talking points. And, and, if, and the whole, anyone that's going to talk about it needs to know what it is. So um, having a brand around that is really important. Yes. I have a Sorry. I'm <laughs> so our friend Peter D. Montes wrote a book called Abundance. If you haven't read it, absolutely must read. And he defines innovation as creating abundance where there's one scarcity. So what are y'all doing to create abundance? Just just before six cents, <laughs> I did something that would, in some circles of hexagon, not be considered innovation. Which is, I looked at we make equipment. Equipment needs support. But we sold a service contract for software with one person, a service contract for hardware with another person, a paid service by a third person. So we called customers and customers, can I get less than 14 calls for supporting this one machine? So we just bundled them. We just, they pay once, we reschedule, we schedule everything on ours by ourselves. All the stuff they wanted was in one price, which allow us to then play with pricing and levels and everything else. It grew 60% in year one and 75% in year two. It's a $55 million business. Today was a 20 million less, less than 20 million just a year ago. Sometimes innovation is just putting stuff in packages that customers will appreciate so you basically take the pain away. So to your point, that's one simple example I can give you. More money. There you go. <laughs> but that's what gets a judge done at the end of the day, right? Is that, that what you're asking? Are you asking, like, how are you? Besides like EPF, you know, your earnings per share, I mean, I've got it, right? But like, how do you think about that culturally and how to like change things that are scarce? Like I look at bot built and I go, they're gonna, their scarcity of housing, they're gonna create abundance of housing, right? So I, 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 I think that's how I look at it. So I was wondering if like, your organization, and, and on, I think it's fine, like, more capital, less, more money, that's abundance. In Hexagon, that's one, in Hexagon, one thing that counts is how much, Paolo is very happy, yes. So every single prop tech company comes to me and says, this is what we're gonna do to fix whatever problem. They, they say they have, a, within their deck, they have a slide that says, or multiple slides that say, this is what we're gonna do. And if we decide to pilot that company, we put exhibit B says, here are the KPIs that you said you were gonna do. Now we need you to prove them out during this pilot. So it's not the same for any, prop, it's, all, it's different for every single one, but, they, but it is part of our standard toolkit that whatever they told us they were gonna to do to help us, are they gonna increase revenue? Are they gonna decrease expenses? Are they gonna make things more efficient? Are they gonna save people time? Whatever they told us they were gonna be able to do, they have to actually work to prove that out during the pilot. Does that, does that answer yeah, it? I, I just like rolling that, I thought, you know, I'm rolling, right? So um, I think that mission, right, about like, there's like the singular mission, and maybe it is earnings per share, but the singular mission around like how corporates think about innovation, or how maybe GSA thinks about, and you know, that, that is a little bit more philosophical, maybe, or mission oriented. Um, I get the EPS. Well, I get a different. I get. A, I have a different answer now than, than you know, a little bit more what you're asking. No, it's the same. It's a just different version of the same answer, which is, in, in the sixth sense context, how do I know that there is abundance? Is all of a sudden we get internal people coming to us and saying, "Hey, that startup, this startup, 
we're interested in working on this. They want to engage. Rather than me having to go and fetch people and ask, tell them what to do, they're now organically coming to us and offering either help or they're offering to send us startups or they're connecting us to a VC or something else. At the end of the day, that takes a little bit of an effort to get to. And now that people are willing, I would say that's abundance in some ways. So, so I mean, as you said, it's, that's correct. What I'm saying is, no, but there's a twist to your point. Uh, I think a lot of us would look because we work for, uh, you know, I work for shareholders at the end of the day and we have to provide certain value. That's one part of it. But I think from a sixth sense perspective, that's a whole different way of looking at it. Yeah, I'm obviously in a different business than everybody else yeah. uh, right now. So mine isn't directly that kind of way, right? But there's a perception about the government that needs to change. And I, don't, I didn't get to hire and cast the right people for, I inherited an organization of 550 people and they're already doing it a certain kind of way. And I can go in there and direct everybody to do stuff, but that only lasts while I'm there. And I've learned that in, in old organizations that I worked at, I can get people to do stuff because I have authority. But ultimately, if I really want to sustain it, it's got to be influence. And that's kind of trying to find those threads that are important to people and get them to move. And the way that you find uh, success in terms of what I think is value is if I can, make, if I can maximize those outcomes. If I could start to see changes in communities because the federal government is there, if I could see changes in economy or in the environment because we've done something, that's where I would see it. We're still going to spend the money. We can do a lot of bad work with the same amount of money, but you can do a lot better. Just move that money around. Think differently with intent and purpose, and you can get there. I think we're getting this thing. Cool. Great. Then that's it. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.